So uh, thank you to David Kierman and the Beverly Hills Bar Association for having us on a, what I think should be a fun panel and some hot topics of, of interest to seemingly everyone these days. Um, it does seem like everyone these days is talking about NFTs, whether you're hearing about it from your kids or reading about it or uh, having clients talk about it or actually doing work in this space. And it seems like uh, the Beverly Hills Bar Association has really seized the bull by the horns here and is doing a whole NFT week with uh, panels each day on a, on a number of topics in the NFT space, including licensing deals, lawsuits, uh, even NFTs in family law, which I, I had not seen before. I think that's, that should be pretty interesting. And we're kicking it off today with a discussion about the regulatory implications of NFTs and the metaverse. We had a star-studded panel of attorneys joining us. I'll let each introduce themselves. Starting with my old law school friend and colleague and white collar partner at Foley and Lardner, uh, Byron McLean. Hello, everyone, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to participate on this panel. Uh, as Mike mentioned, my name is Byron McLean. I'm a partner at Foley and Lardner in our white collar defense group, um, also our Jedi Enforcement Defense and Investigations group. Um, I focus also on civil litigation. Um, I was a former federal prosecutor at the U.S. Attorney's Office for six years uh, in our major frauds division. Um, and here at Foley, um, one of the areas which I do focus on is uh, cryptocurrency, NFTs, and particularly responding to um, SEC subpoenas to companies that are involved in, this, uh, in the NFT area. So uh, thank you so much for having me. Right. I'll turn it over to Doug Miller to introduce himself. Thanks. Uh as Byron said, uh, Doug Miller, I'm currently with the Securities and Exchange Commission. I've been there for about seven years. I am in the enforcement division and I work in a unit that's known as the trial unit. So when cases are being brought by the SEC, at least on the West Coast, I'll be one of the people that serves as trial counsel. Before that, I worked for about 10 years at the US Attorney's Office with Byron. I was in the public corruption section. All right. Uh, next, we have our returning champion, Shane O'Reilly, head of licensing and open source at Meta. Hey, it's great to meet everybody. Um, head of licensing and open source at Meta, uh, where I manage a team uh, that is focused on uh, technology transactions, uh, all of our commercial and IP due diligence for our M&A deals, uh, IP licensing and transactions, uh, open source counseling and compliance, and then lastly, um, all of our academic collaborations and sponsor research. Uh, really look forward to being on this esteemed panel uh, and talking about both NFTs and really providing some insight on the on the metaverse as well. So thank you for having me. Uh, and for those of you who don't know me, I'm an attorney at DLA Piper in San Francisco. I uh, focus on a variety of work in the blockchain space, including litigation, commercial work, regulatory counseling, and uh, these days, probably about 70% of that is in the NFT space. Um, I advise NFT platforms and IP licensors on commercial deals, regulatory issues, and often just general product development. Um, so with that, let's let's get started. So I, I think we wanted to start out with some NFT 101. Um, Byron, what is an NFT? Yeah, so um, and given that we're kind of the first panel of uh, the Beverly Hill Bar Association's NFT week, it makes sense to kind of just kind of define what we're talking about when we talk about NFTs, right? So um, NFT stands for non-fungible token. Um, and what that means, it's a unique um, asset that cannot be replaced with something else. So I kind of try to think of it as a, a one-of-a-kind baseball card. But an NFT, quite frankly, can be a digital art, uh, fine art collecting. Um, it could you know, be a video um, that's made into an NFT. Uh, but what it's not, it's not something fungible, right? So money is fungible. Quite frankly, Bitcoin now is considered to be fungible. Um, and those are things that you can trade one for exactly the same of another. That's not what an NFT is. Um, NFTs also allow you to kind of buy and sell ownership of unique digital item and allows you to kind of keep track of who owns them uh, using the blockchain. Um, but again, it includes drawings, animated GIFs, songs, uh, items in video games. And just to give uh, three quick examples. So for example, uh, it could be a tweet. So Jack Dorsey, who is the billionaire co-founder and CEO of Twitter, uh, made uh, an NFT of his first uh, tweet that he sent out. And it ended up selling uh, in March of 2021. And someone purchased you know, the digital certificate of the tweet. So it was like they were buying his autograph. Um, so a tweet could be an NFT. Uh, a painting could be an NFT. So the, one of the most famous paintings every day is uh, the first 5,000 days sold for $69 million, the, the NFT of that image. Um, it was basically an, a collection of 5,000 images, one for each day since May 2007, spanning the past you know, 13 years. And there was a buyer from Singapore who 
quite frankly, thought the NFT might be worth a billion dollars one day, and he bought it for 69 million in March of 2021. So that's another example. And then kind of a final example would be, could even be like a YouTube video. Um, so an exa a famous example of that one is one called uh, Charlie Bit Me, which was a YouTube video from uh, May 22nd, 2007, of a baby named Charlie who bit his brother, Harry's finger. Um, and they turned that video into an NFT and it ended up, it was an intense auction battle for it. And it sold for 760,000 uh, in May of 2021 um, by these, you know, these two boys who are now teenagers and now they're using the money to pay for college. So, um, so those kind of examples of, uh, of what NFTs are. Now, a, a lot of the NFTs I think you see in the market, in fact, I know that you see in the marketplace and in the public and a lot of the ones that you were referring to seem to be you know collectible items is there a difference between an, an nft and an nft collectible or are they are they practically synonymous at this yeah. point so when you hear about nft collectibles that's typically kind of a collection of a certain type of digital asset that uses the nft technology so it could be like kind of a collection of certain types of photographs or music or video clips um, I think of it kind of like a collection of virtual baseball cards right so some of the most popular nft collectibles would be like the uh, the board ape yacht club um, that's cartoon pictures of like kind of different apes, um, and it's probably the most popular one. Um, there's also like CryptoPunks or World of Women um, that sell, um, and you can buy and trade different items amongst this collection of images. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I know I get the, this question sometimes. In fact, this is probably one of the most common questions, one of the two most common questions that I get about NFTs, and the, and the first one is, when you buy an NFT, you know, let's call it an NFT collectible, one of these board apes or, or an NBA top shot, what exactly do you get? Because I think people are often tripped out by the fact yeah. that you know, there's nothing you get that you can put in your pocket. Like, what do you get? Right. So I would tell you, that was kind of the main questions I heard when I just I first learned about, you know, NFTs. I was like, why would someone buy that? You know, um, and quite frankly, when you really think about it, you buy it for the reason why you, you know, buy anything else. So uh, from a first reason, from a buyer's perspective, one thing is that they have bragging rights uh, concerning the ownership. This is something very unique that they own, right? Um, it also gives them an opportunity to support a particular artist. Um, so for example, the artwork typically comes with like a license that allows the buyer to display it for their own personal use, whether it's on, on their own social media page or uh, a digital marketplace or in a game world or in a virtual museum. You know, So it's kind of the same reason why someone would buy a beautiful piece of artwork for their own home. Um, you're just doing it virtually. Um, the second reason why uh, people, you know, kind of buy these products or sell these products is that it gives um, artists more control over their product, right? So artists generally will, will maintain the intellectual property and the creative rights to the work. Um, and so what the artist is able to do is actually get a cut of the sales when that uh, virtual NFT is resold to others. Um, it also allows them to bypass the middle person. So if you think of like music, you know, typically you have to go through record companies. Well, this allows the artists to actually put the music out themselves in a more easy, easy and convenient way. And then the third thing is that you just, you can just be more, there's more variety in a given creative offering. So you have the on-chain asset, which is kind of considered the NFT, but you can combine the on-chain asset with off-chain benefits, right? So when, you, when an artist is selling their NFT or when someone's buying an NFT, they can get off-chain benefits, which could, could be like free tickets to a concert or merchandise or some sort of unique you know, graphic or beak that comes with that particular type of NFT. So it just really makes the offerings more creative uh, and more unique to the, uh, to the uh, people that are buying it. We, we had a question from the audience that I think was timely on, on this issue. The question is, when you buy an NFT, do you have some kind of a commercial license to the artwork? And I, I think it's helpful to understand a little bit about the evolution of, of how NFT started being sold. So when NFTs first started being sold, it's probably years ago and kind of continuing up until about a year and a half ago. If you were to ask the average NFT, you know, kind of issuer, seller, what exactly are you getting? I know you're saying you're selling this NFT associated with this picture of whatever it is. What is, what is exactly the association? And you wouldn't get a very clear response. And often people just hadn't thought about that. And, and, and I've spoken to NFT platforms, big NFT platforms who said, well, we really don't know. We haven't really thought about it. And increasingly what, what has happened, and this has really become the dominant model, is people think of these as some kind of an IP license where they say, okay, you're going to buy this NFT and you're going to get um, some sort of license to the underlying content. And in some cases, probably most cases, that's a license to use it for personal non-commercial use. 
in some cases, the board apes have tried to go further. They say, well, you can use it for commercial use. So in answer to the question, it really depends on what the scope of the license is that has been you know, granted by the, the NFT issuer, assuming they had the, the rights to grant those licenses. Um, the, the, the other interesting question I think we touched on is why are these things worth anything? And I think that's a really super interesting question that touches as much on the human psychology and behavior as, as anything else. I mean, when you think about a baseball card, right? Uh, you know, a, a rookie Mickey Mantle baseball card is worth X, but you could make a reasonable facsimile of that card indistinguishable from the original card to pretty much anyone. But for some reason, the scarce asset, the original, is valuable to people. It may not make a lot of sense, but it, it just is. Human beings value scarce assets. Right. Um, and these NFTs, around. yeah, and these NFTs are just more forms of, of scarce assets. And uh, you know, I, I don't know that personally. I have a better explanation for why are these things worth anything than that. Well, I, I like to use an example of you know we just saw recently in the news someone bought what they thought was you know Tom Brady's last touchdown uh, pass, the football, for like half a million dollars, right? Why did they buy that? You know, I mean, maybe they bought it just because they wanted to have it. It's a rare asset. They felt good about having it. Now it won't be his last touchdown. <laughs> but you know, at the moment they thought it was going to be. You know, that's kind of similar as to why people are buying NFTs. People like to own rare assets. They like to own something that's unique um, for consumption purposes. I think that's right. Well, let's move on. Let's start talking a little bit about the, the metaverse. Um, Shane, I'm gonna ask you obviously a very similar question. What is the metaverse? And I think you have a, a video keyed up to, to start the discussion. Yeah, and actually I'll, I'll start the discussion and then key up the video. But I think the way that, that we define the metaverse is a, a fully immersive uh, environment, uh, mixed reality environment that combines both augmented reality and virtual reality uh, to really kind of bring the, the physical to the virtual. So, you know, you look at augmented reality right now. Um, augmented reality, you'll see that in your, your Snapchat filters or your Instagram filters, right? You put up, you, you want to take a photo, you put up your phone and you're in Instagram, uh, you put on the filter and it, you know, it makes you look like a dog or it gives you some kind of protruded characteristic, um, whereas everything else around you uh, looks exactly the same, right? Virtual reality is, is just kind of that. Uh, which is our virtual environment. So you'll see that within Minecraft, you'll see that within Roblox, and you know, you'll know you also see that within some environments that are, are based off of uh, blockchain as well, as, as, as well, such as the central land or, or the sand block, sandbox, uh, sandbox too. Um, I think for those folks that kind of know about virtual environments for quite some time, there was Second Life, uh, which was extremely popular uh, for a long time, but it's not, not based off a of blockchain. Um, so those are what you're, what you're ultimately doing is you're kind, kind of combining both that augmented and that virtual reality, uh, and you're just kind of connecting it to the physical. I think uh, probably the best example uh, would be the movie Redder Player One. Uh, I am a big fan, and there was a a scene within the movie in which the, the, the main character, Wade Walker, has this haptic bodysuit on, right? And even though he's in the physical world, he could still, if he, if he was touched within the, the virtual world, uh, he could still feel uh, and experience uh, exactly what was going on. Um, so the video really kind of describes, <clears throat> and this is more of Meta's vision for what the kind of future uh, metaverse looks like. And then I have another slide uh, that just describes, uh, I could give you a description of kind of those aspects of the metaverse in which you see uh, within, which are kind of more common uh, based off of where, we, where we're kind of living right now. So if you could queue up the video, that would be helpful. Uh, and that could kind of show the future state. It's about a minute. We'll be like. Imagine if you could be at the office without the commute. You would still have that sense of presence, shared physical space, those chance interactions that make your day all accessible from anywhere. Now imagine that you have your perfect work setup and you can actually do more than you could in your regular work setup. And on top of all that, you can keep wearing your favorite sweatpants. Looking good. Let's get together real quick for a debrief. Now, let's jump in. Hi. Hey. 
So what do we think? I think it's ready. Great. I'll prep it for the presentation. All right, good luck. Imagine a space where you can tune out distractions and focus on the task at hand. And when you're ready to share what you've been working on, you can present it as if you're right there with the team. Wait, where's Mark? I think he's in the middle of something. And we could we could stop the video here. Actually, it's right right at the end. A few things I want to point out, right? You see the in order for kind of our vision of the metaverse to shape to take place, you want, you know, smaller form fitting glasses, right? Similar to those that that Doug has on right now. And you might have might have seen that within the within the video and noticed that. Um, you saw that there was a hologram, right? That immediately came up and you were able to interact with somebody and you felt like you were literally within the same exact room uh, within, that, within that person. Um, you had the screens that were displayed uh, by those small form fitting glasses. And, you know, in that type of environment, you probably don't even really feel like you need to have a computer, right? Or a laptop. Uh, you've got that environment that is right there uh, that is is physically in front of you. And even though it's virtual, uh, you still feel like you are interacting with it. Now, that is kind of the, the future of, of where we view the metaverse. Let's kind of view where present day uh, metaverse looks like, at least from our company's uh, perspective. Um, this is uh, Workplace, uh, Horizon Workplace. Uh, and as you can see right now, everything is fully virtual. Uh, we have avatars within environment. You can see that there is within that second image there, there's a whiteboard actually within both images, there is a whiteboard. And you know you could have this best experience right now on your, your Oculus Quest 2, right? You have your headset on, you have your avatar, you have your, uh, your remote controls. And based off of your remotes, you could actually interact with this whiteboard. Um, I think something that's interesting, and you probably could even kind of see it on the on the first image, is this: you see a keyboard in that screen there. And I think that is probably the most interesting aspect of kind of that connection to the virtual and the physical that we have present day. You can put your Oculus, your your Quest Two controllers right now. It'll do hand tracking, but also you could pair your laptop. Uh, with your Quest 2. And even though you're within a fully virtual environment, you could still see your keyboard, you could still see your computer screen, and you could directly interact with it, right? You have a virtual desk in a virtual environment in which you could still interact with others. Um, <clears throat> I think you'll see quite a few kind of news articles that talk about the present day metaverse. And I think some of those I think the, the broad definition of the metaverse is actually inclusive of kind of present day. Some people refer to Decentraland and other fully virtual environments that you only access via your PC as part of the metaverse. So when you hear stories about people buying real estate uh, within the metaverse, those tend to kind of be fully virtual environments that, um, that you're accessing via your PC. In the future, you know, with interoperability, you'll be able to access those environments using some type of hardware, right? Hardware devices, whether it is, you know, via our Quest devices or via devices that are prepared by, there's obviously rumors that Apple and Google are preparing devices as well, but you'll be able to access those virtual environments. So even those are, even though those are kind of, uh, uh, they're still encapsulated of my definition of the metaverse, but I think really kind of what makes the metaverse exciting and what's kind of taking it to the next level is the hardware and where the hardware is ultimately going to take us and how it's going to connect us with these fully virtual environments that you only access via PC. Um, so some of the keys to building the metaverse, and I hinted at this, is really interoperability, right? there's gonna be, be a variety of devices and you want to ultimately be in a position in which um, even though Meta has our virtual platform and Apple will have its virtual platform and Google will have its virtual platform, ensuring that people can still kind of access 
uh, these different virtual worlds that are associated with these platforms from their particular devices. Um, higher resolution is obviously going to be key. And then lastly, just from a technical perspective, kind of mixed pass-through sensors. For those that have interacted uh, with our, our MetaQuest devices, um, what you'll see is, you know, you step outside the boundary and everything is black and white. Um, with mixed pass-through sensors, what you'll ultimately realize is that you step outside the boundary, everything, everything is color, everything is in color. It looks as though you're still within the same room and you're still within the same environment, uh, even though, <laughs> even though you have a smaller form fit device on. When you hear in the news that companies like, you know, Victoria's Secret or Adidas or Samsung have purchased virtual land and like metaverse platforms, is that different from what you just showed or is that kind of uh, similar? So it's, it's, it's similar. It's kind, of, it's kind of one step behind, right, what I showed. There's not the only difference between some of the, the kind of metaverse environments that you hear about people purchasing land or, or, or doing branding within those environments is that there's still a fully virtual environments, fully virtual environments that you're accessing via PC, right? Kind of what I'm describing is, is really kind of the, the exciting piece and kind of the next step in the metaverse, which is, which is kind of that virtual piece that, that allows you to, to kind of get away from your PC, mm -hmm. right? And allow you to still access that virtual environment using nice form fitting devices that are similar to those glasses that Doug has on, right? So that's kind of the- All right, enough about my glasses. <laughs> I, I, I actually love your glasses, but it's just, it's just a great reference for it. Nobody else has glasses on here. Um, but, but it's just really kind of what you're hearing is I, I think a lot of people staking a claim in what I think is, is kind of metaverse 1.0, which is still, it, it's hard to kind of, it's hard to distinguish that from what's been done already with Minecraft or Roblox or Second Life. I think maybe the only slight distinction is that, you know, the central land and sandbox are built off of the, uh, built off of blockchain technology. And there's some interaction uh, with crypto, uh, with those platforms that you may not have with those others. Um, so this is really kind of the, the next step of the metaverse, uh, which, you know, again, Meta as a company is, is very much kind of focused on and heavily invested in. So Shane, what, what I think I'm hearing from you, which is I think something that's always resonated with me is the idea that, you know, we're not going to just jump into the metaverse tomorrow. I think sometimes when you when you read articles or hear media about the metaverse, it's like, oh, the metaverse is coming. Oh, the metaverse is here. But when you think about our lives, we increasingly have been living our lives in, in an in a increasingly virtual way. We've moved social interaction online. We've moved commerce online. Um, with Zoom right now, all of a sudden we've moved meetings online and, and each one of these things has been sort of an incremental change. I've always thought that, you know, we're not going to leap into the metaverse tomorrow with, you know, small haptic devices where we just feel like we're immersed in the world. It's going to be a gradual process. And it sounds like that, you know, that immediate uh, is a, a Horizons product it is probably, you know, maybe one of the next steps. And, and that's, and that's absolutely right. Um, and, you know, What's pretty interesting, what's great about this panel and the connection to NFTs is really the interaction between kind of the metaverse NFT, NFT, and, NFT and NFTs uh, with respect to um, artwork. So, you know, I kind of highlighted that, that virtual environment horizon, horizon workrooms. I have my own workroom. I have my own digital art uh, within that workroom. And with the connection to NFTs, although NFTs aren't limited to art, <clears throat> I can have an NFT, my digital piece of art, and I could hang that up uh, within my virtual environment. Or um, I have my avatar and I could buy certain, certain gear, right, that might be associated with the NFT. And something that's super important to the metaverse is interoperability. I want to be able to take my, my, my avatar and my gear uh, that I've acquired as NFTs cross-platform, right? Across different virtual worlds as well. And I completely agree with you, Mike. It's going to be a gradual process. It's not going to be something that, that happens overnight. Um, but I think, it's, I think it's much closer uh, to um, closer to reality than, than most people think. Okay. Well, I think we should maybe start moving on because you know, the, the purpose of the panel is to talk about regulation of, of NFTs in the metaverse. And one of the one of the common questions I get from clients, particularly if they're sort of new to the space, is 
how are any of these things regulated? And, and it's interesting because these, these are new questions. I mean, you know, five years ago, nobody had the slightest clue how these things were going to be regulated. But we're starting to see an emerging application of, of older paradigms to this new technology. Um, and one of the one of the big areas that we've seen applied extensively in the cryptocurrency space um, is the area of securities regulation. So fortunately, we have a trial attorney from the SEC here um, to talk about you know securities regulation and NFT. So Doug, let's start out. What exactly is a security? Because you know if you're in the space, this is a very natural question. But you know for for those of, of us who might not practice all the time in, in the securities field, what is a security? Okay, let me start by saying these are my comments. These are not the comments of the SEC. Um, but I think I can help with that. Um, you know, when do you start to think about when does the baseball card or Minecraft become something different? Something that the SEC might become interested in in regulating as what we call a security. I think it's first, first and foremost, you have to think of it as something that's very broad. So we'll start to go through the definition of a security, but by all means, don't be confined to what you're seeing on the page here, because I think it's more of a concept that I'm going to get into that into some of the later uh, slides. But let's start out with what the statutes say. So you're going to have, if you're looking for black letter on this and you're an attorney listening to this presentation, one of the things that you might want to turn to to get a better sense of, you know, is, you know, uh, an NFT a security is going to be these provisions of both the Securities Act of 1933 and of the Securities and Exchange Act of 1934. Within them, they offer a definition that the Supreme Court has basically said is essentially the same of what is a security. Um, and I think for these two things that we're talking about, you know, metaverse and NFT, the thing to focus on in those definitions will be, is what my client, or if you're an entrepreneur and you're watching this, is what I'm about to do something that might be considered a note or an investment contract. I think that's really what this is gonna potentially trigger. Um, not to get ahead too far, but you know, at this point, the SEC has not defined an NFT as a security, at least in a, um, a published uh, enforcement action. So let's go to the next slide. So for the investment contract, you know, 101, most of that analysis is gonna be driven by a Supreme Court decision that we looked at, um, or you can see on this slide, uh, it's called Howie. And basically what it does and what you may want to do with your client is to look at really four different questions. Are you trying to raise money? So the first question is, is the person you're gonna sell this to, or are they gonna think of it as an investment of money? Of course, presumably they're gonna need to uh, buy whatever it is that's being offered. So the next question is, is it a common enterprise? In other words, are, you know, is it just a one-off? Are you selling this to one person, one image, one digital art, or are you selling things as packages? Are you selling them to a bunch of people with similar characteristics? Next, you wanna ask yourself, is this something that the buyer is gonna think, or even as an issuer, might lead to some sort of profit? Um, and the expectation of profit is usually the biggest factor in the analysis because that's sort of what instinctively we think of as an investment, something that I can make money from. So, you know, as you go through this analysis, I say that that third one is probably the one where you want to slow down and ask yourself the most questions because that's probably going to be a big factor in, in where it comes out. And then uh, the very close second is the last analysis, last part of the analysis whether or not uh, it's gonna rely on the efforts of others. In other words, if it is truly a baseball card, as we've been talking about, or um, some digital art, the value of that is not gonna depend on whether or not someone off in a boardroom is making decisions of, that could affect that baseball card. So when you're looking at the object that is the, the NFT and you're asking yourself, could someone construe this as a security? Again, these are my comments. I think what I would be asking myself is, well, is it, is it going to be a one-off piece of digital art or is it something that really its value is going to be driven by someone else or something else? And if that's the case, then you start to get closer 
to what might be deemed a, a security. Now, um, I think the next group of things on the list of what might, may, uh, might be defined as a security are notes. So this is think uh, lending. And what the way that we see this typically in uh, digital assets is when people decide to use those assets um, and allow people to uh, borrow against them or you lend them out and you'd expect interest in return. Uh, if that is something you may have heard, I think we had a case not too long ago that was released. It was a cease and desist order. Um, I think it was in February. And really the, the, the analysis there was driven by this Reeves case that you see um, on the screen, which another Supreme Court case. And really what they were looking at there is, is this an investment where people are gonna be motivated in entering into this transaction, again, focused on whether or not they can make profits. Um, and a lot of times, I think in defining whether or not something is a note, it's gonna be that same factor number three from whether or not it's an investment contract. Are people doing this with the expectation of profiting? So if you lend money, um, you're expecting interest. In other words, you're expecting to make money off the fact that you're lending someone the use of something. So even though you're technically removed somewhat from the NFT, let's say that your client's thinking about doing something where they're setting up uh, a platform in which your clients can um, allow someone to put forward their NFT and use that to gain interest either because it's gonna be used as collateral for something else and they're gonna be able to make money off it that way, you wanna to look to a Reeves analysis um, and whether or not is, that, is the use of it in that way one, is it being offered to a broad base of people? And two, are those people are going to be expecting to make money? Next slide. On that point, Doug, if I could ask you, because yeah. my expectation is, you know, for the prong dealing with an expectation of profit, you know, it, price appreciation resulting solely from like external market factors, such as, you know, general inflationary trends or the economy um, impacting the supply and demand for the underlying asset generally is not considered profit under like the Howey test. Do you agree with that? I would, I would agree. I think what we're talking about there is if it changes. So let's say that it's not just market forces. So one of the, the cases that we talked about and in, in putting this together um, was whether or not it, a hypothetical case, if um, someone wanted to put together, let's say a platform where you're controlling both the creation of the NFT and the market on which that NFT will be sold and traded amongst, so a secondary market we call it, amongst users. Now you're, you're, the value is not solely based on the digital art, right? The value is based on what digital art you have. So let's call it the Babe Ruth, uh, baseball card, let's say. But imagine you create a universe in which that baseball card can only be resold to someone who also is on the same platform. So now you're starting to take on things where market forces are at play, the desire to have the Babe Ruth card, but also you need to be in a particular forum to carry out those uh, market forces. And again, once you start to do that, as this slide talks about, you may be moving into an area where it's something that's going to be deemed regulated and a security. So, um, did I did I hit the question, Byron? Or did absolutely I... no, absolutely okay. Um, so, when we look at these things, at the, or when I look at these things at the SEC, um, you're really going to fall into two categories. Um, you're going to have people that are just committed out and out to fraud, and they're not there to do anything productive. They're there to rip people off. And you may talk about this. I think there was an indictment out of New York that uh, came out recently. Or you may have great intentions, but you don't register what is going to be deemed a security and you don't follow what the SEC requires you to do if you're going to be offering what is going to be considered a security. So let's focus on that last bunch, uh, registration. We call these registration violations. Did you fail to register what you were offering? And there are if you're looking again for black letter law on this, these are the four sort of areas where you might be uh, determined to have to register 
the security before you can offer it. And really quick, section five, section 15, section 203, and section seven of the Investment Company Act. Um, these are where if you're concerned whether or not your client's gonna need to register something and you've worked through the analysis that we talked about, and we'll talk a little more at the end, then these are the statutes you're gonna to wanna to look to that how do I go about registering? How do I do that? Um, and of course, you know, it's, it's not something that it's gonna jump right out at you, but at least that's the statute where you're gonna start. Um, okay, next slide. Uh, the, this is the case that um, I talked about out of New York, where it, it's two things are happening. One, it's fraud. There's, uh, you're trying to, it's a, a scheme or an artifice to defraud people. So you're not being truthful in what you're offering. And it happens to be a security. Um, if you sort of hit the, both of those uh, bells, then you could be charged uh, under uh, securities regulations for what we call anti-fraud violations. So not only was it a security that you, let's say, didn't register, you sort of lied about what it was that you were gonna be doing with that security. And uh, the case I was alluding to earlier, the block fly, um, block, block fly lending case, this was February 14th, 2022. It was a cease and desist issued by the SEC. And in that case, that was sort of what happened. You had something that was deemed a, a security in the digital asset space. What they were doing essentially was allowing digital assets to be loaned uh, to BlockFi so that they could get interest off them. And then they would pay that interest back to the owner of the digital asset. They also, according to the, the, um, the order that was issued, made misrepresentations about the extent to which those assets that were being um, put forward by people and allowed uh, to be used for interest to the extent to which those were um, collateralized. And so there you had everything ringing. You had a class determination that it's a security. You had a determination that they failed to register it. I think you even had a determination that they were an investment company act under the, the 40 act and they were uh, committing fraud. So that is a case if you wanna to look to it that sort of hit all of the problems that could, things that could go wrong in this area, uh, that would be someplace you'd wanna look. Another thing I didn't bring because we just don't have the time to walk through it and it's not mentioned in these slides, there's an April 3rd, 2019 memo that was written. It's called the Framework for Investment Contracts and Analysis of Digital Assets. If this is all moving too fast for you, read that. I think it gives a very good explanation of things that you should think about uh, if you're gonna get into this area. Next slide. And just to pause yeah. on that, I, I agree with that, Doug. You know, the, the SEC has published this like 10 page framework for how to analyze blockchain based assets to determine whether they're a security or not. It's, it's my understanding it's non binding, but it gives some insight into how the SEC might be thinking of this. Um, it's gotten a real kind of like double edged response with some people saying, oh, I don't understand any of this. I think it's unclear. Um, on the flip side, I, I can tell you that I have, have personally seen and also know that a lot of other practitioners use it in doing analyses, particularly of, of cryptocurrencies. So it's, it, I, I've found it to be at least a, a useful document and I would recommend that people at least check it out to give at least some insight as to how the SEC is thinking. I agree. I, I, I you know, I, I didn't, I'm sure there's always criticism of everything, but um, I found it in preparing both for this and, and looking at other matters that it's very helpful. It's somewhat technical, I think, but that's because I'm new to all of this. Um, but I think it, it at least gives you a roadmap to think about these issues. It, it definitely doesn't give you a final answer, but you know, again, until you know the facts, you really can't reach a final answer. Yeah. Um, you know, this is, I think, the big question and probably uh, some of you logging on today were wondering, you know, if this was going to be answered. I don't think there's an answer to this question at the moment. Right now, the SEC has not done in any enforcement actions uh, on F NFTs solely to date. Um, but that doesn't mean that they're not going to ever be classified as a security. And I tried to illustrate this by putting up a couple of cases that um, can explain how this could happen. So you have Marine Bank where you know, certificates of deposit, the Supreme Court very clearly said are not securities, but then Merrill Lynch uh, and Gary Plastic thought of a new way to use them. And that 
in doing so, they created a secondary market where they were selling CDs, uh, but they were also allowing people to redeem those CDs without any penalty by creating the secondary market. And I think these cases are probably what's behind some of that guidance we were just talking about, because what you'll see if you look to these cases is that really what the court is doing and what I think the guidance that the SEC has put out encourages is to look at the substance of what you're talking about. Um, don't read just the statutory definition of a security. Don't read Marine Bank and think, all right, I got this figured out. Don't need to read Gary Plastic. Look at the smart contract. Look at whatever marketing that's going to be done to uh, advertise that to potential purchasers. Look at the platforms that they're going to be sold on. I mean, you really have to look at all of it and look at the substance of the transactions that are going to be undertaken because that's really the only way that you can get to, I think, the right answer, or at least one where you can feel like you've met your professional responsibilities to give advice on the issue. So um, it sounds like, Doug, even if you're saying like it's not just the asset itself, but like the circumstances around it, right? So it's not only the form and terms of the instrument, but also the circumstances surrounding the digital asset and the manner in which it's being offered, sold, or resold, which could include a secondary market sales. One hundred percent. You know, I was going to leave this to the end. This Dapper Labs case, um, which is, uh, I think, was filed in New York. You know, I won't render any opinions on whether or not that is a security or not. But I think that is exactly what is being set forth in the complaint. Is look, we're not just talking about the NFT. Is how I read the complaint. We're talking about the NFT. We're talking about how the value of that NFT is derived in the way in which it's marketed and in the way in which it's sold. And then they have created, at least according to the complaint, what appears to be a secondary market that allows people who want to use that NFT to, to buy one of those, to go ahead and go into their secondary market and sell it. What, what I found interesting in that complaint, again, I don't know if it's true, is that that secondary market can only be accessed by people who purchase that NFT, which I found to be very interesting. And then secondly, um, th the person or the organization that issues those NFTs sort of has a control volume, a volume control knowledge that they can decide how many they're going to issue. They're going to, they can decide uh, things that could affect ultimately the value of the NFT. So, you know, to get to your point, I think that's right, Brian. I think you have to look at everything. You can't just look at the smart contract, uh, which I, I think that's going to be the biggest part of the analysis, but you know, you also want to look at, you know, who, where's the secondary market for this, if there is one. You know, if it is just honestly, you know, uh, crypto kitties or whatever, and there's really nothing else there, then that might, you know, I think you can probably safely move past the regulatory analysis, or at least the securities regulatory analysis. Um, but if there's much more to it than that, then you should slow down and, and really ask yourself these core questions about what, what's happening, what's the need of the transaction. I think that's close to the end of the slides, or maybe not. Next slide, please. Um, factors to consider. Uh, this is what I've tried to uh, highlight earlier. You know, I think for uh, me in, in evaluating a case, this is what I would come back to. This is the forming case. This is an interesting case out of New York originally, where it had to do with uh, the sale of units of, in Co-op City, which I'm. I, from New York. If anybody's from New York, you know Co-op City. And uh, in that case, the, they were analyzing uh, whether or not um, sales of the units in the co-op were securities because they had used that term in the marketing materials. And ultimately, the Supreme Court said, no, the reason I cited it here, you're going to find 100 cases that analyze whether or not something is a security, is in that case, what really the court seemed to turn on was the fact that it was being used for personal use. And I think at this juncture, most NFTs are likely to be considered being used for personal use and no one's buying an NFT with the idea necessarily that it's gonna have, uh, uh, it's gonna be used as an investment. Maybe that's changing, maybe it's changing by the hour or maybe People have those interests, but there's no platform or secondary market on which to exercise them. But assuming you're buying the you know, crypto kitties just because you think they're cute or you just want a sense of ownership over something or a history, piece of history, um, 
I think Foreman would sort of be the case that leads you to determine that that's probably not a security. Uh, last slide, I think. So again, this is to Byron's question about look at everything. You know, I tried to go through some of the things that you might uh, want to consider um, in, in analyzing these issues. Um, for the derivatives, that's, you know, you may or may not know what that means. That's like, is the value of this NFT um, somehow tied to something else, right? Like, are you, is a derivative of something else? Like, are you saying, all right, we're going to create an NFT that, you know, tracks this, the, the value of some stock or something, you know? I can't see how that would be done, but you know, or I'm sure it could be done, but why you would want to do that. But you know, those sorts of questions, uh, personal use, I just talked about for Foreman, obviously, because it can get you into a lot of trouble, not just uh, with the SEC, but as Byron's gonna talk about with criminal authorities, you should make sure it's not false or misleading. You know, are you lending it? Are you trying to get money off something that at its core is just an NFT, but you're using it to get interest? Uh, or are you, are you just starting out? Are you trying to get capital and raise it so that you can get your NFT off the ground? Because what you'll see in that guidance is, even though you may not have stood up everything, uh, if you're projecting that your NFT is going to be used on future platforms and you're raising capital for that purpose, you could be deemed to have created a security, even though those events haven't transpired yet. Okay. I, Sorry, Mike, I wanted to get through all of it because I know there were some people that wanted the black letter. So, but I'm happy to, if you had more points as a, you know, moderator that I can talk to you now. No, well, I, I do want to give Byron a chance to talk about criminal law. Okay. The, the, the securities question has always struck me in, in some ways as funny because the question of whether an asset is a security ends up, I think, not actually coming up a whole lot in the securities practice. It's something you learn about in law school where you learn about the Howey test, then most of securities practices, well, how do you actually register this you know, stock for an IPO or, oh, is this you know, stock scheme fraudulent? But the question of, is this a security doesn't come up that often uh, prior to blockchain where now it comes up all the time. Um, but I, I, I do think we should move on. So I, I wanna talk to about, about criminal laws. So, Byron, what sort of criminal laws might NFTs implicate? And obviously, this is a very timely question for reasons I think you're about to discuss. Yeah, so um, so there are kind of like th three categories that are kind of percolating in particular. One is what's called uh, in the industry wash trading. So that's basically executing a transaction in which the seller is on both sides of the trade in order to paint a misleading picture of the asset or the NFT's value and liquidity. So it's like, you know, selling the NFT to a new wallet that the original owner also controls or has self-financed. Um, so that's something that, that's being seen in the uh, in the kind of the criminal realm. The other uh, second is, uh, you know, your traditional money laundering, right? So buying NFTs with illicit funds and then reselling the NFT for you know, cash. Um, and then a third, which is an example that just came up yesterday, is what's kind of referred to as the rug pull. So it's a scenario where, you know, the creator of an NFT or a gaming project will solicit uh, investments or money and then abruptly abandon a project and fraudulently retain the project investors funds. So there was just a case that was announced uh, yesterday out of the Southern District of New York. That's an example of this kind of rug pull uh, uh, type uh, fraud where two defendants were charged um, with NFT fraud and money laundering fraud scheme. Uh, they basically executed a $1 million NFT fraud scheme in January of 2022 uh, by defrauding purchases of NFTs called Frosties. Um, and they were in fact preparing to execute a second scheme by selling NFTs advertised as embers um, prior to their, to their arrest. Um, they were planning to sell these uh, by the end of this month. And basically what would happen with the Frosties is that the purchasers would be eligible for a holder rewards such as like giveaways, early access to a metaverse game, exclusive passes, um, and once all of these frosties were sold, instead of being able to reap the rewards of, you know, these these different uh, NFTs, basically, you know, the defendants or the fraudsters basically took down, or the alleged fraudsters took down, um, you know, the the platform, and they basically took all the money, the, the million dollars. And I will tell you, these defendants were only like 20 years old, so like very young defendants um, that are involved in this case. Um, and it's it's something that, you know, when you think of it at its core, it's basically you know, you're kind of typical fraud crime, right? You're soliciting money for a business opportunity, you're abandoning the business and you're absconding with all the money your investors provided you with. Um, it just happens to involve NFTs. Um, so uh, that's something that's definitely, those type of cases are definitely 
um, becoming more and more of a focus of the uh, U.S. Attorney's offices around the, uh, the country. Uh, in particular, the Department of Homeland Security has a new kind of task force that's called the Dark Web and Cryptocurrency Task Force out of the Southern District of New York. And also, um, the, our, the Deputy Attorney General, uh, Lisa Monaco, has established a national cryptocurrency enforcement team, the NCET. So they're definitely going to be focused on this, um, yeah. the criminal world. And just to build on that, Byron, you know, one, uh, that's not a case that was charged, I think, under conspiracy to commit mail fraud. So there they did not undertake the analysis, just in case people thought maybe that was an example of whether or not something's a security. They didn't undertake that analysis. They didn't need to. It was fraud. Secondly, the SEC also has uh, similar initiatives. Um, don't think that uh, you may be able to you know, throw something by the SEC because of a lack of resources or uh, prof professionals that know this area. Um, in preparing for this, I was surprised and you know, I think impressed at the same time of how much, um, how many uh, people have been devoted to this at the SEC looking into these issues and so they're definitely uh, people watching. Yeah. So I, I think we want to talk, uh, maybe give some final thoughts before I, we'll see if we have time for a question or two. But you know, to, to wrap up, what are from each of you some suggestions that you have for practitioners in the space who might be advising clients, um, maybe focusing on risk mitigation or just other you know, general best practices on complying with you know, regulations or measuring regulatory risk? So I'll go first. I mean, one of the things I would just, just say broadly is, you know, do your due diligence, you know, like no matter, you know, uh, what you're selling, um, do your due diligence. Uh, you wanna, you know, know exactly what you're buying. So for, I think the point was made earlier, when you're buying an NFT, typically you're not buying the copyright itself. You're just, you know, that's usually not part of the sale. Um, and understand that. Make sure that, you know, if you're selling the NFT, that the person who's buying it kind of understands that and it's clearly identified what's being sold and what's not being sold um, so that, you know, you don't have any um, anything on the back end, you know, of allegations of, you know, fraud and that sort of thing. Um, so it's very, very important to do that. The second thing I would mention is that if you think there is any type of, you know, illegal activity or if you're the, you know, the victim of, you know, um, what you think is a potential fraud, you know, definitely report it to the federal authorities, um, no matter what the, you know, kind of amount is, because even if, you know, let's say in your, uh, something involving you, you know, you can't re recoup the funds, um, and, or you think it's a, a small amount, you know, you never know what that particular um, uh, entity might, you know, be going after other people for larger amounts, or it might fit into a bigger puzzle that you're not even aware of, that the SEC or the, you know, the DOJ is going after. So I would definitely encourage uh, reporting any uh, legal activity that you uh, perceive in this area to the authorities. I can, you mind if I go next, Mike? I'm not the decision maker, of course. Well, I would say, you know, because just to sort of come up with something different, because I think I would obviously exactly say what Byron said, but, you know, one of the things that I've seen um, that I think can sometimes, not, maybe not, I don't know, uh, you know, you want to document as an attorney what you were told by your clients. You want to document, uh, you know, if you are, advising uh, and coming to the position that something is not a security, um, you know, a lot of times um, the people that we come across, they will point back to their attorneys, having been someone that made that determination. And then when we start to really pull the layers back, it's a lawyer who has very good records can, you know, presumably this happens, um, talk to their client and explain to them why they never actually knew the things that the client is now saying, hey, you know, come in and tell them that you told me this was not a security. Um, because usually it starts out, yeah, my lawyer said it, it was okay and no big deal. And then we say, okay, well, you have to, under the rules, you're going to have to let us talk to him or her. And then eventually they come back and say, no, no, actually, we're not going to be asserting uh, an advice of counsel defense. And a lot of that, I think, comes from good record keeping to show that, no, you never told us you were going to lie about all these things. So, you know, document, document, document. And lastly, I'll, I'll just piggyback on, on top of what, what, what Byron actually said. I, I think, do you due diligence? These are emerging areas of the law that I think are still being developed. Uh, so it is, it is important that you, you do your due diligence uh, and, you know, you consider kind of, you know, every variable in every situation and you stay current on, on all the curse, case law that is, 
emerging uh, within these within these areas of law, because that that case law is ultimately going to provide guidance. And uh, in some situations, you may be provide may be surprised uh, by the guidance that that case law ultimately provides. So um, I think just staying up to date on case law uh, and these emerging areas of law is, is really going to put you in the best position because it is still very new. And as you could tell from this panel, still being still being developed uh, as well. And, and I'll tell you from my perspective, I mean, there, there's the obvious, which is, you know, make sure you have somebody involved in any project who understands securities regulation the way that might apply to NFTs, the same for money transmission regulation, which we, we didn't get to touch on, sanctions violate, you know, sanctions law, privacy law, uh, make sure you have somebody who understands the, the technology. Um, I think I think a lot of that goes without saying, and those are, you know, kind of very broad topics that, that you know, would take a while to, to go into each of them. But, uh, you know, as a, as a more general, like practical tip, I would say probably the number one place as, as someone who does both commercial deals and, and litigation, where I see risk is promising things uh, that, that are hard to deliver. Um, and this is, you know, this is very, in a lot of times natural or, or, or doesn't come to the mind of an entrepreneur who, you know, sometimes they move fast and they break things and they say, oh, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, where from a legal side, you know, it's imperative to issue spot and, and look at public communications and say, no, you need to be very careful and thoughtful about how you phrase each one of these things, because that impacts both, both civil uh, litigation risk as well as regulatory risk, you know, as I think Doug and, and, and Byron would agree, who have, you know, both been federal prosecutors and now Doug, Doug with the SEC, you know, a, a regulator is more likely, I think, to pursue you if you're not just in violation of some, you know, technical regula regulation, but there's also maybe some sort of fraud or other bad behavior going on. So that, that would be my, my best tip. Um, I don't know if we have time unfortunately for questions i feel like they've they've all sort of piled up maybe if we want to pick one or two um let's see here so what, what, one question i've seen come up uh, a number of times is where can we find these sec framework and if you email one of us we can send you the link but essentially it's called the sec i think framework for uh investment contract analysis of digital assets doug do you have the exact name yeah, uh, April 3rd, 2019, Framework for Investment Contracts Analysis of Digital Assets. And that, I mean, if you were to go to the enforcement page and put in any of those words in a search, I'm sure you could find it. Um, I have an internal thing that I use and I just, I, it would be useless to offer it how I got it. But yeah, I'm happy to provide it to, to Dave or to anybody if they want to somehow share it. And if it helps with search, I think that was uh, issued by what FinHub, right? Which is the strategic yes. hub yeah. for sure. innovation and financial technology of the SEC. So that's strategic hub for innovation and financial technology of the SEC. So if you Google that, you might find um, references to it as well. Um, the other the other question that I saw come up, which I actually had come up in a, in a recent panel about a month or two ago, is can you buy NFTs with with fiat or, or U.S. dollar currency? or only cryptocurrency and the answer which i loved which was given on the panel which i'll give now is yes if you give me a bag of cash i can give you an nft so <laughs> um with that said thank you all for attending the panel uh please feel free to reach out to any of us with additional questions and otherwise see you out in the metaverse thank you thank you